Good evening. My name is Jillian McDonald. Welcome to the Regional Municipality of Wood Buffalo Virtual Community Town Hall. Thank you for joining us this evening. We're here tonight to take your important questions regarding flood recovery. Our panelists include Mayor Don Scott from the Alberta Legislature, Fort McMurray Wood Buffalo MLA Tani Yao, Scott Davis, the RMWB's Director of Emergency Management, Jamie Doyle, the Municipality's Chief Administrative Officer, Matthew Huff, Deputy Chief Administrative Officer, Chris Booth, Manager of Planning and Development, Greg Wolf, Chief Building Codes, Chief Building Safety Codes Officer, Kevin Weidlich, the President and CEO of Wood Buffalo Economic Development Corporation, from the Insurance Bureau of Canada, Vice President Western, Rob Dupree, Jen McManus, VP Canadian Red Cross for Alberta and Northwest Territories. From the Alberta Emergency Management Agency, Brad Geddes, Executive Director, Recovery. And from Service Alberta, Senior Investigator, Mike Martin. If you would like to ask a question of one of our panelists, hit star three on your phone and you will be directed to an operator who will take your question. We encourage you to ask your questions live on the line. However, if you aren't comfortable, we can read them for you. Mayor Don Scott is going to have some opening remarks, followed by the RMWB's CAO, Jamie Doyle. Now I would like to turn the floor over to Mayor Scott. Uh, thanks very much, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are on Treaty 8 and unceded Métis territory, as we always do at council meetings as well. And I'd like to thank Tana Yao for being here, the other elected official who's with us, and all those who are uh, participating this evening. So there's a couple of messages that I want to make sure we get out tonight, but uh, an important event is happening tomorrow in the community, and everybody should look up in the sky uh, at some point. I'll, I hopefully will have more information before the end of the call as to when, but the snowbirds are going to be flying over this community tomorrow. Uh, we, they are landing at the airport, as we understand it, at about 10.30, and I'm assuming that they're going to be in the sky shortly after that in our community, but we'll try to announce when. But if you hear a loud noise tomorrow morning overhead, that means they're here. Make sure you go out and look up. It's going to be fantastic. I've seen them before. It's a, it's a great, something that we will all enjoy. So as far as housing is going, we've had a lot of questions about how long people can stay in housing, uh, in hotels or other accommodations, if they have been impacted by the flood. So we want to make sure that people understand if you cannot occupy your home right now, we, through the Red Cross, will continue to provide housing support until Friday, May 29th. So we're, we're going to continue to work in partnership with the Red Cross, and many thanks to the Red Cross and the government of Alberta to develop a longer-term interim housing solution. Uh, as far as the Boil Watery Advisory water billing is concerned, I think uh, many of you will be aware that if you're impacted by the Boil Water Advisory, your water bill will be reduced. Uh, we passed a motion at Council that the uh, water bill would be reduced and that the amount of the total reduction is going to be 2.4 million so that's going to be spread out it's businesses and residents so there is going to be a reduction and that's meant to compensate people for the amount of uh, additional expenses that they are incurring as a result of the boil water advisory so please be aware of those two items and i look forward to your questions this evening Thank you, Mayor Scott. Before I turn the floor over to Jamie Doyle, I just would like to remind you, if you would like to get your questions into our queue, please hit star three on your phone and you will be connected with an operator. Up next, Jamie Doyle, our Chief Administrative Officer. Thank you, Jill. We continue to work with Alberta Health Services and Alberta Environment and Parks to lift the boil water advisory. Our focus has always been to restore clean, safe drinking water as quickly as possible. This has not changed. Given the progress to date on the multi-phase plan to flush, disinfect, and test water in the water treatment plant and the 375 kilometer potable water distribution system, we now anticipate a significantly shortened timeline on lifting of the boil water advisory. Residents across the urban service area should prepare for elevated chlorine levels for approximately two weeks as we begin the flushing of our water distribution system on Sunday, May 17th. I want to stress, water can still be safely consumed after boiling for one minute. Residents will find an increase in the smell of chlorine in the water 
and it is normal if some discoloration occurs. To reduce the smell of chlorine, water can be boiled for a longer or left on the counter or in the fridge overnight without a lid so that the chlorine can evaporate or dissipate. Water also remains safe for bathing. For more information about how to use water safely during a boil water advisory, please visit albertahealthservices.ca. Residents will also see crews in their neighborhoods flushing hydrants. Crews have already been have already begun disinfecting the thickwood and timberly reservoirs and will be working approximately 24 hours a day for up to a week. They will also be working at the lower townsite reservoir in Abbasand throughout the weekend. This will result in increased noise levels in nearby areas. The disinfection process will not impact water quality. We fully recognize that this is a significant inconvenience However, by addressing this challenge head-on, we expect to have the water system fully restored by early summer. We encourage anyone with questions about the boil water advisory to visit rmwb.ca forward slash water. I also want to note that municipal curbside support provided for residents who could not boil water uh, due to d disconnected utilities will end at 4 p.m. on Friday, May 15th. The staging area at the corner of McDonald Avenue and Morrison Street will no longer be in operation after this Friday. If residents have further need for bottled water, the Wood Buffalo Food Bank is currently operating on an emergency based system serving weekly hampers at two temporary locations. More information can be found at woodbuffalofoodbank.com slash assistance. Lastly, I would like to note that Clearwater Drive will be opening to the general public on Friday. For more information on recovery efforts, please visit rmwb.ca slash recovery. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. And Mayor Scott has an update on the snowbirds. So I just got a note from uh, RJ Steenscher of the airport, so I'll just read it out as he sent it to me and you'll uh, have the best understanding we have. Uh, there seems to be some uncertainty in details. but. Uh, the snowbirds leave Cold Lake at 9 a.m. and will fly to La Lache, Saskatchewan, and then to Fort McMurray. They will do the flyover and then land at our airport at 10.30 for refueling, and then they head out to Edmonton later on in the afternoon. So that's the best information we have at this point, so uh, be sure to keep an eye in the sky tomorrow. Thank you, Mayor Scott. Now we are going to turn to our question queue. Again, if you would like to ask an important question, please press star three on your phone to be connected to an operator. And now we will jump into the question queue. Our first question comes from Brendan, and Brendan asks, do I need any building permits to repair the flood damage in my home? We will ask Greg to take that. Yeah, thanks for the question. I know that's a question on a lot of people's minds. Building permits are required if the uh, any materials beyond or behind the interior finish of your basement or uh, e even on your main floor are required to be changed. So that would include insulation, vapor barrier, uh, studs, and so on. So, um, But beyond that, I'd also like to just remind the citizens that um, our council felt it was, again, really, really important that people were able to obtain the permits they need affordably and so the permits are in fact free as are the inspections. Um, so we just would really encourage people to get those permits. Um, there's really no excuse. Anybody who's um, a professional contractor for sure should have no problem applying for permits and will understand the permit process. And if you're a citizen and you don't have experience, we've got a great team of staff up at Timberley Landing that will assist you, as well as permits can be applied for online through our e-permitting uh, system as well. So lots of options, and we're, we're really just there to help you. And uh, another, another issue that came up and question that's been quite common is, and has perhaps held people back from getting permits is that uh, they are under the impression that if they apply for permits that we're going to be imposing all kinds of unreasonable uh, code requirements that are um, required perhaps in modern dwellings. Uh, we want to assure you that 
if your house was built in 1981 or 1980, we only require it and expect it to be built to the same standard that it was at that time. So hopefully that'll allay any fears people have with getting permits. I also understand that uh, permits are a requirement for uh, DRP funding. So um, Brad, perhaps you can jump in here on that. Thank you very much, uh, Brad Geddes, Executive Director of Recovery. Um, to add to that, uh, yes, we do look uh, to the local uh, leadership uh, and the local bylaws uh, for the standards for rebuilding. To uh, In order to get uh, reimbursement under the program, copies of uh, uh, completed uh, building permits uh, will be required uh, for substantive uh, repairs and renovations. I would encourage you to work with the, uh, uh, the, the, the very capable staff at RMWB uh, and for our listeners in Fort Vermillion uh, with your leadership there as well to obtain the building permits. Um, there will be case managers assigned to specific files and uh, uh, when you get to further into our process. But for now, the most important part is, uh, uh, yes, uh, please uh, build in accordance with local uh, building codes. I hope that answered your question. Thank you so much, Brad and Greg, for answering that question. Again, if you would like to ask a question of one of our panelists, please hit star 3 on your phone and you'll be directed to an operator to take your question. We can take them live on the line or we can read them for you. Our next question comes from Dan and Dan asks, why are wearing masks not mandatory for everyone? I'll ask Scott Davis, our Director of Emergency Management, to weigh in on that. Thank you, Dan. Uh, as yet, the uh, province has not mandated uh, uh, masks. However, they are strongly recommended in crowded public areas uh, like mass transit or where uh, physical distancing of two meters apart um, is not uh, available. Thank you, Scott. Our next question comes live on the line from Wayne. Wayne, your line is open. Please go ahead. Uh, is it safe to take a bath during these elevated levels of chlorine? Thank you for your question, Wayne. Our Deputy Chief Administrative Officer, Matthew Huff, will take that. Thank you for the question. Yes, it is safe to, uh, to take a bath. Uh, the key takeaway from this boil water advisory is if uh, you intend on consuming the water, that you should bring it to a rolling boil for at least a minute. If you would like uh, to uh, reduce the chlorine smell, you could boil the water for longer or, as the CAO uh, noted uh, just a few minutes ago, uh, you could also leave uh, uh, it in the fridge overnight uncovered or, or on the uh, uh, bench as well. So yes, uh, it is safe for taking a bath or a shower. Thank you, Matthew. Again, star three on your phone if you would like to ask a question of one of our panelists. Our next question comes live on the line from Lorna. Lorna, your line is open. Please go ahead. Hi, yes, thank you. Um, in concern to the flooding in the Clearwater and Harden area, where the flood water did not come from the river over the Berm Road, I'm just wondering if you can explain to me what the issues were and what will be done to help those um, with their insurance that will not cover it due to it uh, being said it's overland, but in fact, it was not. Thank you for your question, Lorna. I'm just going to reiterate. So the question was, what was the issue with the flooding at Hardin and Clearwater Drive, correct? Correct, Lorna? That's correct. Perfect. Thank you. And I believe Jamie Doyle, our CIO, will take that. Uh, thank you for the question. It's a very good one. Um, we're we're very aware that there's many statements uh, in about the community about factors beyond the ice jam that may or may not have contributed to the April flooding. Our focus uh, right now and continues to be recovery of our community. As we move forward, we will review the factors uh, surrounding this event. Until we finish that process, uh, it wouldn't be wise or fair fair to the community to make any unconfirmed statements or reach any preliminary conclusions. 
Uh, that being said, uh, we, I don't want to speculate or, or comment at this time. Thank you, Jamie. Again, star three on your phone if you wish to ask a question of one of our panelists. Um, our next question comes live on the line from Tom. Tom, your line is open. Please go ahead. Just a reminder, Tom, you will have to unmute your phone. Okay, I'm going to read this question out for you, Tom. Tom asks, how was the storm sewer system compromised? How did the sanitary sewer system get compromised? I believe Jamie kind of covered that, but we'll just get him to reiterate. Thanks, Jill. And sure, I'll reiterate. Um, as I mentioned, we're aware about all of, of all of these uh, statements and comments and um, social media about um, factors that would have uh, seen beyond the ice jam that may or may not have contributed to the flooding. Um, as we move forward, uh, we're, we are reviewing the factors uh, of this event, but until we finish that process, it wouldn't be wise or fair uh, to make to the community to make any unconfirmed statements or reach any uh, preliminary conclusions. Uh, that being said, I wouldn't want to speculate any further. Thank you so much, Jamie. Again, star three on your phone if you would like to get your important questions in our queue. Our next question comes live on the line from Grayson. Grayson, your line is open. Please go ahead. Yeah, I just want to ask a question about the water being approved to not have to boil in Anzac and Gregoire Lake. If the water treatment plant's in town and you've got to flush everything out to clear it all up from the water treatment plant in town and through all the 300 kilometers of lines, how does the farthest area out get approved it, that they're already all cleaned out and everything? I'm just wondering if sh shouldn't it start at the water treatment plant and work its way out that way? Thank you for your question, Grayson. Our Deputy Chief Administrative Officer, Matthew Huff, will take that. Thanks for that. Uh, a, a very astute question. The uh, testing of the water uh, that uh, uh, travels uh, that distance uh, proved uh, that uh, it was not uh, affected uh, by the uh, uh, the original turbidity problems that were, uh, were in the city. Uh, we did, however, have to change uh, the uh, the supply uh, for those that uh, receive water by truck from uh, from uh, an, another location. So uh, uh, as we worked through that, the boil water advisory was in place, but was able to be uh, lifted by Alberta Health Services uh, just a couple of days ago. Uh, so whereas uh, the rest of the system uh, has to be subjected to uh, uh, the uh, disinfection um, uh, program. Uh, the uh, the pipes serving uh, those communities, uh, uh, well, ANZAC in particular, uh, are in good order. Thank you, Matthew. Again, if you would like to ask a question of one of our panelists this evening, please hit star three on your phone to get your questions into our queue. Our next question is anonymous, and they ask, how and where would I go for assistance as a small business owner of a healthcare practice? And I will ask Kevin Weidlich to take that. Uh, yes, thank, uh, thanks for that question. The, um, the, so there's a number of, uh, uh, of uh, aspects to that. So if you own a small uh, uh, healthcare practice and you're looking for guidance on, on, on uh, what you should be doing uh, with regards to reopening, uh, then, then uh, you can go to the uh, alberta.ca uh, slash bizconnect. And also, uh, you can go to our local website, uh, wbcentral.biz. That will be live tomorrow, wbcentral.biz. That will provide that information. And likewise, uh, with regards to the Disaster Recovery Program for Assistance for Small Business and Landlords, you can go to the um, alberta.ca um, sla slash disaster hyphen recovery hyphen pro uh, programs uh, to, um, to seek that assistance. So that's kind of a complicated uh, link, uh, alberta.ca. You can search for disaster recovery programs, but, or you can also go to wbcentral.biz. The same information will be there. Thank you so much, Kevin. 
If you would like to ask Mayor Scott or any of our panelists a question, please press star 3 on your phone to get into the line. Our next question um, comes from both Trevor and Janine, and they're both wondering where they can find up-to-date water monitoring data and any information, um, the results of the water testing. So I'll ask Matthew Huff to take that. Thank you for the questions. Yes, uh, the, uh, uh, we're posting some of that uh, information uh, uh, immediately before, during, and after uh, the event uh, on uh, well, as part of our frequently asked questions. Uh, you will be able to find that at rmwb.ca slash recovery. Uh, so follow uh, uh, that to uh, the FAQs about the boil water advisory. That's where we're posting those. Thank you so much, Matthew. Again, star three on your phone if you would like to ask a question of Mayor Scott. We also have MLA Yao in the room as well as many other um, panelists. So please hit star three on your phone to ask your important questions. Our next question comes from Alex. Alex asks, will asbestos be sampled for materials removed from homes that are on their way to the landfill or are already there? And there's a second part of the question that is, will there be financial support for asbestos abasement in addition to the DRP? So I guess we'll start with Jamie. We'll take the first part. Uh, thank you for the question. <clears throat> Quite timely, we were just actually speaking about this morning. Um, at the landfill, at the scales, uh, they typically uh, do ask for um, type of, I guess, proof that there is asbestos there or if there isn't, and if there is, that it was properly handled. And if if it's already gone through, we're, we're keeping an eye on it. We'll have some um, further information on our own testing as we move forward. Thank you, Jamie. And Brad, would you have anything to add about the financial support for asbestos debatement in addition to the DRP? Yeah, I'll start. Uh, there's a, possibly an element here as well from a colleague at the Insurance Bureau of Canada. Um, so first off, uh, for people who have questions about the program, we've simplified the link. Uh, there's already a link on the RNWB website, but you can also go to Alberta period CA slash DRP, uh, and that's alberta.ca slash DRP. Uh, there's program guidelines and how to apply there. Uh, we're also going to be uh, advertising more information about the program in coming dates. Um, with regards to the specific question regarding asbestos abatement, I would go back to the, my previous point regarding local building codes. Um, so I would encourage uh, the homeowner or small business that does have asbestos to make sure that they disclose that as part of their insurance claim uh, and as they work through the, 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 that part of the process. That's very important. Second, uh, that as part of their application through our web portal uh, for a homeowner or the uh, PDF document, that they note that on their file. Uh, part of our program requires us to confirm insurance information, but we also send out an evaluator to your property and uh, they'll work with you as to options of what is and is not eligible in our program. Uh, again, it's going to be important that uh, the homeowner would have already talked to, uh, to RMWB about local building requirements uh, when repairing uh, asbestos. So with that, I'll defer over to uh, my colleague at IBC and uh, any, anyone else that uh, wants to add to that. Rob Dupree, do you have anything to add? Yes, thank you. It's, it's Rob with Insurance Bureau of Canada. So if you do have overland flood coverage under your policy, make sure that you're speaking with your claims representative if you think that there may be some asbestos or other contaminants that are at your property. Many policies have specific language and may have coverage for making sure that they take care of those appropriately because remember there is special handling that's required. People should not be doing this on their own without knowing what they're doing and having the appropriate personal protective equipment. Now we do recognize in some of these areas some people may not have insurance coverage or some people may have some smaller limits to their coverage that may not pay for all of the damage. So we'd like to remind people that if you do have insurance coverage to make sure you're going through your insurance policy first to go through that claims process. 
But if you have insufficient coverage, you can also be applying for the Alberta's Disaster Recovery Program. So you could have an insurance claim. And then for the areas that weren't covered by your insurance, you can proceed through the application process through the government DRP. So this is something that was initiated that uh, you've heard Mayor Scott talk about and, and MLA Yao and MLA Goodridge have certainly worked very hard to, to get this program uh, up and ready and, and certainly the government is able to, to provide that. And we just want to let people know that there will be coverage for both. Now, having said that, under your insurance claim, if you claim for a SOFA, you can't be claiming for that same SOFA under DRP. But if there is damage that you have that's not covered by your policy, certainly you can proceed through that application process through the DRP. Thank you very much for the, for the question, Alex. Thank you, gentlemen, for answering those questions. Again, <clears throat> star three on your phone if you would like to ask a question of one of our panelists this evening. Our next question comes live on the line from Dustin. Dustin, your line is open. Please go ahead. Hello, thanks for taking my question this evening. Hello, sorry, thank you for taking my question this evening. Uh, my question is for Mayor Scott. I know you had brought it up before Council about uh, financial assistance for folks who were put out and were on their own dime in their hotels. I'm just wondering if there's been any update through the recent Council meetings on that. Thank you for your question, Dustin. Mayor Scott? Yes, uh, Dustin. So just to, I'm just going to speak to two different issues. Uh, it sounds like you're in uh, the first part of this. So if you evacuated and didn't register, and I understand many people were in that position, and they, you simply went to Edmonton or went to another location, uh, a motion was passed to support people in that position. So I'm just going to give you an email, which is my email. If you are uncertain where to go, just send me an email. It's mayor, M-A-Y-O-R, at rmwb.ca. Now, if you're in position number two, it doesn't sound like you're there, but just for anyone else who may be, if you're evacuated and your home is still not safe to return to, interim housing is available until May 29th, and you can contact the Red Cross. So uh, be sure, and if, if you're struggling with what to do in your position one or two, you can email me at mayor, M-A-Y-O-R, at rmwb.ca. Thank you, Mayor Scott. And that number for Red Cross is 1-800-863-863. 6582. Our next question comes live on the line from Mildred. Mildred, your line is open. Please go ahead. Yes, I was wondering, you mentioned that there were two locations for the food bank here in Fort McMurray. Would you be able to tell me what those locations are? Thank you for your question, Mildred. Jamie, our CIO, will take that. Thank you, Mildred. Uh, very good question. There's two locations. Uh, one is in Thickwood, the other is in Gregoire. Uh, Thickwood location is at Fort City Church at 101 Spruce Street, and that's open from Monday to Wednesday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., Thursday, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., Friday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., and the Gregoire location is Golosky Landing. That's 187 Mackenzie Boulevard. That's the first right after the uh, SPCA across the parking lot from Legacy Car and Truck Wash. And that location is open Monday to Friday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Thank you, Jamie. And thank you so much for our callers this evening. If you would like to get a question into our question queue, please hit star three on your phone and you will be directed to an operator. Our next question comes live on the line from Elin. Elin, your line is open. Please go ahead. Just make sure that your phone isn't on mute, and I may have pronounced your name incorrectly. I apologize. E-L-A-N. Go ahead with your question. I think it's, my name is Lan, L-A-N. No E, sorry. Okay. Go right ahead. Yes. Yeah. So um, I think during the pandemic and uh, the flood, um, our local workforce really uh, showed their accountability to support our local business. Uh, especially the oil sands, to make all the plants uh, consistently uh, run. So um, my question tonight to uh, Mayor Danscout is that you know that this uh, pandemic and flood really already uh, damaged our local economy badly. So do you have um, any plan to make um, Fort McMorris strong again? 
because I'm thinking after the flood, maybe some people will leave. Like、um, same thing happened during the wildfire. So, and、uh, I would like to know what's going on for the camp things. Are you going to、um, still negotiate that camp thing again? Try to cancel some camp if possible, and keep those job opportunity to local. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Lan. Kevin will take the part about、um, local businesses and the economy. Yes,、uh, thank you, and thank you for that question, Elan. The,、um, uh, in fact,、uh, we are current. We struck.、Uh, we, as in uh, uh, the community,、uh, through a, a motion by the council, ha has struck a business recovery task force、uh, that works closely with Wood Buffalo Economic Development Corporation, and we are、uh, building a、uh, business recovery plan, which we look forward to、uh, presenting to council uh, 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 later later this spring. Uh, so that business recovery plan will address、uh, what we、uh, believe needs to be done uh, to uh, to help with the local economy.、Uh, that's the first part of the question that I can contribute to. Thank you, Kevin and Mayor Scott. Can you speak to the work camps, please? I'm just going to、uh, briefly touch on Part A as well because the、uh, our council is very concerned about business. We need to position business to bounce back from this. So one of the things we did at the last council meeting just a few days ago was a 168 million dollar tax reduction from last year. That's going to support industry, businesses, and residents. Everybody should see a tax reduction on the property taxes from last year. So、uh, we're, we still have a strong budget, and、uh, there's nothing to worry about there. We're still going to be providing the services, and we're going to invest in our local economy. And One of the things you may have noticed is that we put out a statement confirming that we are hiring local. It's one of the things, as a municipality, it's one of the things that I have encouraged everybody to do in this region. If、uh, you know, especially because we're recovering from so many things right now—a flood, a pandemic, and an economic downturn—we、uh, have many challenges. And if we're not prepared to support our, our local businesses, I think we're going to be in some serious difficulty. So I would encourage everybody to shop local. Uh, it's it's very important, especially if you're involved in flood recovery.、Uh, there was a time after the fire when what I'd call、uh, ambulance chasing contractors came up here and took advantage of people. Let's make sure that does not happen.、Uh, encourage anybody you know. I can't control who people hire privately, but I can certainly encourage it. And I want to make sure that everybody has somebody local.、Uh, that that person is going to be here for the long haul. They're going to make sure, and they have a vested interest in, in the success of this community. Uh, as far as camps go, I was asked about that today by by the media. I'm always keeping my eye on that issue.、Uh, it's not the primary issue right now. I want to make sure that we are focused on recovery from all these other challenges. So it's something I keep an eye on. But、uh, you know, our relationship's never been stronger with industry. One, part of the、uh, notion with the tax reduction is that they were going to make sure that they kept more people in this community and made sure. You know, I'm, I'm confident they're going to hire more people. Uh, who are contractors in this community? So I'm feeling very confident about that. Now the province is doing a fair amount of work on that. I'm not sure if Emily Tanny Yao wanted to weigh in on some of the provincial things that、uh, are being done to support the local economy.、Uh, but I know that、uh, there's been a tremendous number of of announcements by the province. So I'm just looking to see if Tanny Yao would like to weigh in. Yes, he would.、Uh, yes.、Um, Thank you for the question. And、uh, yes, the province is looking at、uh, various ways of supporting businesses and whatnot.、Uh, what we've, we're experiencing right now is an, an unprecedented uh, uh, challenge for not only our region, not only the province, but the entire nation and the world.、Uh, so they're again continuing to gauge how things are.、Um, the good news is, is today, you know, we've、uh, opened up stage one for Alberta to allow. Uh, certain businesses to reopen, with the exception of Calgary and Brooks. And、uh, depending on how things go here, we're looking at、uh, stage two and ultimately stage three reopening. So,、uh, but to that effect, regarding finances for businesses and whatnot,、uh, they're continuing to look at it and evaluate it and see how they can address those issues. Thank you. Thank you so much for addressing that question. Our next question comes live on the line from David. David, your line is open. Please go ahead.、Uh, thank you.、Uh, is there any opportunity from the city perspective to see what influence you might have with Canada Post since the flood, 
our mail has, service has been minimal, if any, probably uh, maybe three days, four days since then we've had a bit of mail. The mail has to be somewhere. Um, would there be an opportunity to maybe poke that, that giant a little bit to see if we can get the mail moving again? Thank you for your question, David. Our CAO, Jamie Doyle, will take that. Thank you, David. It's a very good question. Canada Post has resumed uh, their delivery to areas that are not affected by the flooding. Uh, they're also attempting to serve uh, the affected lower townsite area uh, where it's safe to do so. So you should expect some delays as there's a large backlog, as you can imagine, of mail. Uh, mail carriers are, are doing their regular routes. Um, however, if for some reason the mail can't be delivered to a certain location, they'll hold it until, until it can be delivered. Uh, social economic checks that cannot be delivered due to flood recover, recovery uh, will be available for pickup at the Canada Post location in Thickwood at 121 Signal Road. Uh, those residents and businesses that's been displaced because of the flood uh, can take advantage of the free offering from Canada Post, their mail forwarding service. Uh, you can visit the Canada Post website to set that up. Canada Post uh, will also be updating their website if anything changes, and of course that's uh, canadapost.ca. Uh, you can also call them directly, if you wish, at 1-866-607-6301. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie, and thank you, David, for the question. Our next questions come from a few people in the, regarding DRP funding. So Mike, Robert, and Betty, they're looking for more uh, clarification on what the DRP funding is, if it's going to cover... Um, if it's going to pay for the rest of the rebuild cost, if their insurance is exhausted, can they apply for DRP while waiting on their insurance claim? And if the DRP would provide the money before construction begins. So I'm going to throw to Brad of the Alberta Emergency Management Agency if you can answer or clarify more on what DRP is. Great. Thank you very much. I will start. Uh, I may ask my colleague, uh, Rick, uh, to join me uh, for some of the particular questions. And if I miss a question, uh, Jill, please let me know. Uh, again, it's Brad Geddes, Executive Director of Recovery. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to explain what the program is and is not. Uh, first off, it covers uh, not only uh, the cost of the municipality in terms of uh, cleanup costs, uh, repairs for water treatment facility, uh, repairs for damaged infrastructure. It also covers costs for uh, the, uh, the we'll work to reimburse the cost that the municipality took on uh, for accommodations and meals. Uh, the other component is uh, we break it down into two groups. So there's uh, supports for uh, a broad class we call small business, but that includes not-for-profits, institutions, condominium associations, uh, agriculture producers. And so I'll refer to those group as small business. Uh, we're working with uh, the Economic Development Group of uh, RMWB to set up a special webinar uh, to walk uh, those applicants through the program. Uh, again, uh, the simple email address is alberta.ca forward slash DRP. Uh, most of my comments I'll focus on private sector, <clears throat> but like I said, uh, there's information there for the small business group. So for residential, um, it's important for uh, all applicants to know that the program is not equivalent to insurance. It's, an, it's intended to provide basic functional condition only. So an example is if you had a granite countertop or you had a uh, uh, a, a, a good TV will provide you with a countertop and a TV. So my example is that will provide you with a basic uh, functional repairs. It's not the equivalent of replacement uh, that some people would have experienced as part of their insurance claim uh, with respect to the wildfire. So the full value or whole uh, level of support uh, is not available within the program. However, um, it is intended to make sure that people have the resources for their recovery. So what I mean by that is, is that the program will 
Um, accept applications today. Our online application portal is already open. So you can fill in your name online at any time that you want. You can submit um, a description of your damage. You can let us know which rooms in your home have already been, have been damaged. And the value of that is that then we can start uh, uh, hiring uh, both case managers and evaluators to provide you with service and uh, as you're working through your insurance claim. So you don't have to wait for your insurance claim to work through. I'll give an example. Uh, if you're doing um, repairs to your basement and there's a mixture of sewer backup from insurance as well as water came in through the windows or some other source of overland flooding, uh, what we would do is we would look to uh, learn what we can from the insurance claim that you've already started our evaluator will come and visit you at your home. Uh, they'll take measurements of the area that was damaged. They'll calculate the amount that was paid for under, that we can pay for under our very basic program. They'll deduct uh, each dollar that has been paid for by insurance. And then that difference is the amount that the disaster recovery program will pay for. So uh, I'll summarize it this way. The disaster recovery program is the payer, the last payer after insurance and other sources like the Red Cross. Uh, we work with the Red Cross and we work with insurers to coordinate the claim. So the best thing that people can do today after they get off the call is to uh, make sure they're registered with the Red Cross. We're going to be working with them to make sure that information gets pushed out to possible applicants. That will help you with your accommodations and meals while you're displaced. I would ask that you make sure that if you haven't started your insurance claim, uh, that you find your insurance documentation and you follow up with your uh, insurance company or broker or adjuster, they'll be able to guide you. Um, and then when you have time, fill out the application form online. It's open till 8 August 5th. That's August 5th. So there is time. Um, we will be, uh, we also have a, one eight, uh, a number that people can dial. Uh, that number is 1-888-671-1111. Again, it's 1-888-671-1111. And uh, if you're having troubles uh, figuring out how to apply, how to work through the program, uh, if, by calling the number, we can help guide you through. Now, the good thing is, is that for those people that applied for evacuation uh, payments uh, from the government of Alberta, there, you would have received a My Alberta Digital Identity uh, password. That same password is the same password you can use to apply to, our, to the Disaster Recovery Program. Um, in the meantime, uh, I just want to clarify what types of coverage are available. So there's modest accommodation uh, benefits and meal benefits beyond uh, what RMWB uh, will provide. However, again, that'll be after uh, anything provided by the municipality or the insurance company. You'll have to work with uh, a case manager to determine that amount. We do provide funding for the cost of cleaning, repairing, and replacing essential property, including time spent on cleanup. So I would ask that people uh, Although it might be additional paperwork, I would appreciate it if you could take time to, uh, to track those costs. If you uh, are a senior or you're having difficulty uh, with the, the significant burden that is cleanup of your yard, uh, there is, uh, we do cover the cost for your cleanup. So just make sure you get a written uh, document, uh, including uh, where possible a, a business license number from the company that's providing you with support with cleaning up, uh, and uh, those costs would be eligible. Um, another significant point is that we do not pay for lost income or wages uh, incurred as part of the cleanup. So in summary, uh, please connect with the Red Cross and apply uh, with them. Make sure that you're connected, as we'll be working with the Red Cross to push information to applicants. Please make sure that you're filing an insurance claim. We'll need that information to make a final settlement. And third, please document as much as you can, taking photos, uh, uh, writing down time spent on your, on your uh, cleanup and your repair and your placing essential items. 
We do pay on quotes uh, for a majority of uh, residential uh, expenses. So uh, if you need a, a new furnace, um, I would encourage you to get a minimum of two quotes for things that are going to cost you over $2,000. So that's a good rule of thumb. There's more specifics, but try to get quotes uh, when and where you can, and uh, we'll do our best to, uh, to calculate the payment based on quotes. Uh, if you're having significant structural repairs or uh, major renovations um, that would require a substantive uh, rebuild permit from RMWB, um, that is going to require uh, detailed estimates and uh, uh, receipts. Uh, but we have ways of working with you to make sure that the cash flow uh, works for you between you and the contractor. So I would just ask that you uh, work with your insurer, uh, make sure you document as much as you can in the application, and uh, if you could please be patient with us as we are quickly ramping up in order to provide very good service. Um, and I want to make sure that, uh, that as you're working through this, you have someone to work with. So please be patient with us as we staff up and we make sure that we have people to answer your questions. So that was a fairly long answer. I hope I answered the question. Uh, so I'll turn it back to you, Jill, if there's anything that I missed. Thank you so much, Brad. Uh, lots of valuable information in there. Hopefully everybody got it. Um, but just a reminder that the town hall will be available in its entirety sometime tomorrow, probably by the evening, and you should be able to view that on um, our website as well as our, web, our YouTube channel. Um, so our next question comes from Nabil, and it's live on the line. Nabil, your line is open. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, good evening. Uh, my question is on the future development. Uh, on the planning side, are we uh, planning on putting any infrastructure in place to reduce the floodplain uh, in the downtown area uh, to make sure that uh, if we have a reoccurrence, we're not putting people and property at risk? Thank you for your question, Nabil. Our Deputy Chief Administrative Officer, oh, no, our Chief Administrative Officer, Jamie Doyle, will take that. Thank you, Nabil. It's a very good question, and uh, thank you for bringing it forward. It, it's not lost on us, and we've been thinking about uh, redevelopment here for the past few weeks, of course, and administration has been working really hard to figure out and, and suggest development options um, within this flood hazard area. Uh, as we finalize those uh, those options. We'll bring them forward to Council in public forum for discussion, uh, but please know that uh, we're working very di diligently on this. Uh, we want to be as comprehensive and complete as possible. So thanks for the question. Uh, stay tuned and we will have the, some of these uh, options front of, in front of Council as quickly as we can. Thank you, Jamie, and thank you, Nabil, for your question. Our next question is Anonymous. Anonymous asks, is the RMWB tracking price gouging by contractors? For example, one company quoted 40000 for work, insurance will cover 10000 and another company quoted and conducted much lower. So I'm going to ask um, Service Alberta Mike Martin if maybe you could weigh in on this. Hi there. Yes, thanks for the question, uh, Mike Martin, Consumer Investigations Unit. Uh, we've been dealing with a price gouging thing uh, with, with an uptick in the price gouging since the, the entire pandemic here uh, hit Alberta. Um, as far as, as, as specifically as the RMWB uh, tracking, I can't speak to that. However, the, uh, the Consumer Investigations Unit, Service Alberta, is tracking these uh, these. Uh, these investigations and, and complaints specifically, yes. Thank you so much. And Mayor Scott would like to weigh in as well. Yeah, uh, I can tell you that I get a lot of information about price gouging. Each time we hear about it, we pass it along to the authorities. So if you're not sure who to pass it along to, if you're a bit uncertain, send it to my email. It's mayor, M-A-Y-O-R, at rmwb.ca, and we'll make sure it gets to the right people. Thank you, Mayor Scott. Our next questions come from, or question comes from Hannah, Juanita, and Dan, um, and they're all about physical distancing. They're concerned about overcrowding in grocery stores, and they're wondering how many people are allowed in stores and um, how it can be enforced um, for, to enforce the six feet or two meters. 
So Scott, could you take that, please? Thank you for that. Uh, we continue with our bylaw as well as public health to monitor uh, businesses. Uh, if you do have a concern, um, what I would suggest is uh, bring it to uh, the ownership of the business and or uh, submit a complaint to AHS public health inspectors and you can find that at alberta.ca slash COVID submit a complaint. Thank you, Scott. And we're, we only have about eight minutes left, so we have a few more questions to get through and then closing remarks. Our next question comes from Louis, and Louis asks, is the RMWB pursuing a buyout plan for residents of waterways, and what is the timeline for a provincial federal buyout? And I'll ask Jamie Doyle, our CAO, to take that. Thank you, Louis. Um, another great question, very similar to the one uh, Nabil just, uh, just asked. And as I mentioned to Nabil, um, it's certainly not um, something that's lost on us. We're, we're looking at all development options, uh, not just in waterways, but the entire flood, ha flood hazard area. So that would also include Ptarmigan. Um, we're working pretty hard to get this in front of council as quickly as we can for public debate and discussion. Um, administration has been working pretty much around the clock on some of these things. So uh, stay tuned. Um, as soon as we have this uh, ready to go in front of council, it'll be posted publicly and uh, you can participate in, in, uh, in discussion. Thank you, Jamie. And Brad, would you have anything to add to that? Yeah, again, uh, thank you for the opportunity. It's Brad Geddes, Executive Director of Recovery. There's two aspects um, that, that uh, I think Jamie touched on. I just want to um, underline. The, the first off is that it, it cannot be lost on any of us, and, and, I, and I have heard this very clearly for, from His Worship, uh, Mayor Scott, that we, we need to make sure that everybody has a voice in the process. Uh, these are people's homes, these are people's memories, um, and uh, they're, it's a significant uh, anniversary that uh, we're all experiencing. Uh, with the uh, from four years from the fire, and it's uh, very important that as we're going through, and, and although we're talking um, about a community and the, the possible options there, uh, I just want to reiterate that it's not lost on any uh, uh, body in the government of Alberta uh, who is providing me with support. Uh, for example, uh, our, our capable, very capable MLA, uh, Mr. Yao that we need to make sure that people are taken care of. So I would just encourage uh, those people that are impacted in, in the waterways community um, that although there's, there is a big conversation to be had uh, regarding uh, your homes and the future of them, it's also very important that they're taking care of themselves. So uh, with that, what I, the direction I provided my staff is to, to do what we can to expedite support uh, for accommodations and meals, and to uh, provide it uh, where we can expedite payment for uh, contents uh, that may have been damaged. Uh, again, I would encourage any of those residents to reach out to the Red Cross to make sure that they self-identify, um, as we'll be working with the Red Cross to arrange additional supports, whether it be mental health or, or other as may be required. So they are very good partners, and they need to be kept in the loop. I would encourage you to start the conversations with your insurance companies. Uh, I appreciate we're probably running out of time, but there are there may be options that insurers can also bring to this conversation. And then thirdly, uh, if, as you're applying, um, I, I would appreciate if people could self-identify uh, which communities they're from uh, and that this is a concern of theirs uh, as they're applying the program to make sure uh, that nobody gets missed in the process. So. Uh, just to reiterate, it's a very uh, sensitive conversation. There's a lot of impacted families, and uh, my thoughts, uh, uh, and also my direction from the senior leadership is to make sure uh, that we're reaching out and, and there for those citizens. Thank you, Brad. We are almost out of time here. So, Jen, could you quickly just um, let everyone know what the phone number is for Red Cross so that they can get in touch with you guys? Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Brad. Um, I think I need to hire you for the Canadian Red Cross. Uh, you can reach us at 1-800-863-6582. We are um, taking calls from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. 
just want to also reiterate that uh, all calls and disclosures to the Canadian Red Cross are private and confidential. And the more we understand of your situation, your household, your family, the better we can give you support, advisement, and uh, referrals and information. And as we move through the DRP um, experience, then we can also assist alongside of the Government of Alberta. Thanks, Jill. Thanks, Brad. Thank you, Jen. And again, that number is 1-800-863-6582. That is all the time that we have for this week's town hall. Before we wrap up this evening, Mayor Scott would like to say a few words. Mayor Scott? Hi, I just have another update on the snowbirds. Uh, It's uh, an ever-changing situation. Councillor Murphy, whose uh, son is a pilot and in the military and is a huge snowbirds fan, uh, has been listening. And she has been updating me as we've been going along this evening. She's indicated that uh, the actual time when they're going to fly will could vary depending on weather conditions. And uh, you can double check, and it's the Canadian Forces Snowbirds Facebook page for updates and any delays. And they're going to post updates as they take off. So the time that we've suggested earlier that it was going to be before 10:30, that that could be in doubt. So it, it may be after 1:30. I'm I'm hearing different times. So the best way you're going to know is to check uh, the Canadian Forces Snowbirds Facebook page or check Councillor Murphy's Facebook page. Uh, One of the two are going to have all the right information. Eventually, we'll have it on the municipal uh, site as well, as soon as we can get it up there. But keep an eye out. That should be out early in the morning. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Mayor Scott. And thank you to our panelists and to our residents for taking the time to tune in this evening. Our next town hall is one week from tonight, May 21st at 6.10 p.m. Thank you for joining us. Stay safe, stay strong, and have a wonderful evening.